Hello, I present today a new episode of Euro Integrators program, and my guest today is Alexander Daniluk, ex Minister of Finance of Ukraine and a member of the team of Volodymyr Zelensky, and Brian Bonner, uh, Kyiv Post editor. Hi, Brian. Thanks for having me. Hi. Alexander, Alexander, you have recently held a meeting with ambassadors of EU and other European officials. What were the results of those negotiations? And tell us, please, would your team continue pro-European course of Ukraine and also move to NATO and EU direction? Uh, this meeting was held upon the invitation of European side. Of course, our pre-election campaign was very active and we did not hold foreign visits during that campaign. A visit to France was the one exception. There were many questions put to our new team, what we are facing ahead and what were our steps to respond to challenges. That's why we were invited to Brussels, uh, to answer these questions clearly for our partners. They also wanted to define the points in which we would need some assistance. It was very important that all the 28 ambassadors were present in that meeting. We could put our questions different questions, we also answered the questions sending our signals to all European states. It was a very effective use of time, I think. It would not correctly to say we reached concrete agreements, it was rather answer question style dialogue. But what we brought out of that meeting, all were willing to support us. And they see the credit of trust we gained in the elections, more than 70% of people voted for Volodymyr Zelensky. Uh, together we know that such a trust opened a huge opportunities for us, and we should not lose those opportunities. That's the reason uh, they want to help our team. But they would assist if we would have a strong, reliable team and if we see the right direction to move forward. And what is the direction? Where are we moving to? We clearly understand the direction. I mean foreign policy direction and I also mean changes within the country. The changes would show whether we have the trust and support of the world. These processes are related. There would not be any people's trust in Ukraine without change. If the situation does not improve, we would also lose the trust of European partners. There is a connection, right? Uh, so we talked it over, defined our priorities, they are the same we declared in our election campaign. This is fight against corruption, rule of law, including judicial reform. We had clearly explained how we were going to restart it. And this is reform of law enforcement agencies. Uh, this is the points to start from. In those areas we had a little progress. These institutions are not functioning as it should be to regain the trust of people. We have to make those institutions work. This is our priority. Brian, your question. Oh, I've got a lot of them, but uh, <laughs> one of them is that uh, it looks like the president-elect is not going to get the chance to call early parliamentary elections. Therefore, he could face a very obstructionist parliament with the public at the same time demanding quick wins. What would be your advice? What would be the quick wins that he could pick up before the next scheduled elections, uh, October 27th? A um, couple of things on that. First, there is no ultimate goal to call a snap election, right? There is no goal to dissolve parliament. Um, that institution should work, right? And, um, you know, what I describe as a priority steps that will involve some uh, decision-making by the parliament, appointing key people, Prosecutor General, for example, uh, head of SBU, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of Defense, uh, and that needs to be credible people with reputation, and the parliament should approve this candidacy when they're nominated by the president. Uh, then there will be laws that will launch anti-corruption in, uh, infrastructure, changing the leadership there, 
in those institutions which lost uh, credibility, in including agencies of prevention and corruption, for example, right? Similar for relaunching a judiciary reform. And I'm not mentioning that I should have started from this, is electoral code. We understand, what majority of people understand, that under current legislation, we will not be able to get a better quality parliament. Because half of the people are majoritarians, right, the single mandate uh, deputies, and usually the way to win, not I cannot say that it's everywhere the same, but usually the way to win, it, it's a commercial exercise, ex exercise, so to say, right? So then people, uh, when they buy into, my, uh, into the, uh, uh, in the seats in the parliament, they later swap it for some political or business concessions. And that called corruption. Mm -hmm. So obviously electoral code is crucially important. So why I'm saying this? If that parliament is capable of adopting decisions which Ukraine waited for so long time, you know, I Did think- you promise to adopt actually. Promised many times. Yes. Uh, uh, so, you know, that parliament should work. You know, there is no reason to, to dissolve it, right? It should work and, and do good for the country. Do you think it should? Right? If it does not. Do you think it'd be. Results. You want to force a vote on lifting parliamentary immunity from prosecution, presidential impeachment law, put them on the hot seat? Members of Parliament? Uh, yes. I think uh, the initiative needs to be, uh, as you know, this is one of the initiatives, key initiatives of, of President-elect. Uh, but um, we need to put in order what is actually more important, right? And I would start with electorate code because it changes the system. And it allows also people to deliver on their promises. Immunity, it's another promise that's been promised every you know every election so that should be one of uh, you know of the priorities but obviously uh, without relaunching anti-corruption infrastructure or appointing the credible prosecutor general you know the thing will remain the same it's not about even whoever is going to win parliamentary election it's just bad for the country to lose the momentum is bad for the country for the people every time people have some hope and this, is, this hope is not uh, kind of realized, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's really uh, bad for the for morale of the nation. If you are not in time to change the parliament, what would happen to those hopes put on the new president which have gained 73% of the votes? Uh, there is a risk that all your initiatives would be blocked in parliament and government and you would be unable to work efficiently and effectively during the half a year period, losing the momentum you mentioned before. Well, first of all, we realized that 73% resulted was the figure just of a presidential election with two candidates running. If we talk about parliamentary election, we should see a broader choice of political proposals for voters. This fact will change the overall situation and the voters would be more divided, it's clear. It's a parliament election with many powers taking part, not just a single winner in the end of campaign. There are several parties in the parliament. People are always waiting for decisions. But decision comes not just after desire to make it. Ability and opportunity is also needed. For example, the reform of security service, the removal of some toxic personalities in politics. This is what people expect to get. They hope to see prisoning authorities for corruption doings. If this would not happen, it would be the negative signal. People want toxic politicians to get out. If we ignore it, the level of trust would reduce for sure. That's inevitable. The only right variant, we should create a team with a positive reputation, and that's really my worry.
Are you sure they let you do this except uh, for the presidential administration? Uh, what could stop us? There are some other posts appointed by the president, the head of National Bank Security Service as well, uh, the Council of National Security and Defense, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Minister of Defense. Those are very important posts. And I feel confident the parliament would vote for once appointed by the new president. That voting would show the real face of the parliament. Uh, this team must be a team of quality. If it contains some people to which we have some questions and complaints, it would immediately reduce the level of trust to the president. What role would you like? Would you, would you think your skills uh, would be best suited for? Look, I made it very clear since the very beginning, right, that uh, there are two stages in my, you know, in my involvement. First, is to help uh, government to change, you know, government in broader sense, right? And first of all, starting with the president. I believed, and I clearly communicated even before our first meeting with Vladimir, is that um, uh, having Petro Poroshenko for second term is really bad for the country. Um, despite everything, it's just bad. After you, you know, you know block reform for so many years, you know, he, lied directly to people, it's just really bad to have such person re-elected. You know, let him learn some lessons and maybe, who knows, if he learned the lessons, he may come up as a new, you know, with uh, new, new proposals, maybe people will trust him. But at the moment it will be really bad. So I, you know, at this sense, I, I think I, the first uh, stage is, is uh, successful, right? We have a new president. Um, second, uh, stage will will depend on my role and who will be the team and uh, there are some heated discussions I can tell you about this because you know usually it usually it is accepted that you know you have your role mind your own business that is wrong I believe in teams I don't believe in the collection of individuals who is acting in their interest. I believe in teams that share the same um, vision, yes. right, and work towards the same goal, helping each other, not fighting with each other, not one protecting another, uh, one people's interest in another, another. This perfect balances in Ukrainian politics, um, you know, blocked Ukraine progress for so many years. So that's why I'm very adamant, and I'm pushing this. I can tell you that it's not always received well. Everybody's trying to, you know, it's a normal approach in Ukraine, is to cut to pieces and, uh, you know, mind your own, only on your, your own part. I really hope that in this case for Ukraine, we should get the new team, which is um, exactly as uh, I described. So it has the same vision, and going to the same, um, you know, achieving the same goal, helping each other. If it's not, I will not consider the role on this team. You know, there is no reason for me. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm only investing time when there is opportunity to have an impact. If there is no opportunity to make an impact, I already spent a lot, enough time on, on, on some position fighting with the people who were supposed actually to help me to provide political coverage you know, and uh, pushing uh, changes that affect interests of leadership of the country, including president, prime minister, working, working against them, this is, you know, I don't want to repeat it again. It's just not why we have elections. But, you know, so, but answering your question, that depends on the role. But obviously, uh, giving uh, my roles uh, in the past that I was involved in the national security issues, in the in economic, finance, so it could be anything in the, in the, in the, in the government, but giving that Minister of Finance is like a second position in the government pretty much, right? So uh, obviously I would like some, you know, uh, Monday that allows me to use all my, uh, my knowledge. Now you are responsible for international activities in your team, right? This is one of your duties. Uh, what do you think? Uh, what were the international mistakes made by the previous authorities? 
When I worked as a Minister of Finance, I was also engaged in different international cooperation. It has often been about huge amount of money, about trust or mistrust. In this area I had understood many things. What I learned was uh, how not to build relations with international partners. First of all, we have to understand what we want. If we don't understand, no one would help us, no one answers our questions. When they answer, but we do not understand, it seems like formality. In such conditions, we try to fulfill that formality in a formal way. It's not effective, it's like dead end. So we have to know what exactly we plan to achieve and how to do that. The effective team should create a common goal and everyone should work to reach it. We should understand what our country should be like. I am willing to see Ukraine as a strong regional leader which influences the situation around. We should be treated like the center of stability, center of development. I want Ukraine to deal not just with own issues, but to help others in the region who face challenges. And we also could become the reliable partner for our strategic partners. This is the first point. The second is that we have to provide a trust, we should deserve it. It's very easy to lose, but hard to get. I have got very an exemplary case – fight against corruption. We started in 2014 creating National Anti-Corruption Bureau, National Agency of Prevention of Corruption, Introduction of Online Declarations, I worked as a deputy head of presidential administration, being involved in this process in connection with the civil societies, uh, uh, of course. I was responsible for that, especially the law on uh, Nabu, I saw the huge restriction. It seemed corruption was trying to protect itself. It looked like we wanted to fight corruption, but in reality it was like all wanted to block our desire to fight it. And all the activities were directed to achieving this result. But when some time passed, our partners opened their eyes and saw what is behind the screen. And they had already knew that we are not honest. So we lost the trust and that's not acceptable. Well, uh, we said we wanted to keep changes, but in fact we did not. After such fails, it was hardly to hope for increasing assistance or solving different political issues, including situation around Russia. Uh, they put a question, why are you not fighting the corruption even during the war? Why? Does it make your country stronger or it doesn't? Why do our Western partners have to force us to fight the corruption? So, we have understand what we need to do. We should engage our partners just in cases where we cannot handle the problem ourselves and in which we are not experienced enough. So I would like to develop cooperation with our partners in such a way. You talked about the, the, the uh, non-existent fight against corruption during the Poroshenko's years. Uh, that One of the biggest ones was $20 billion bank fraud. You're quite aware of, of how Ukrainian taxpayers were robbed and uh, the biggest bank, Privat, 5.6 billion, quite aware of that. What have you, and for, for the public, the litmus test for Zelensky's independence is what he's going to do about the bank fraud that, that took place. Is he gonna get a prosecutor that will take it on and prosecute it? Or will it go the opposite way and even fall back into the hands of uh, those who allegedly took the money. Uh, let's just separate these two. I know that you're trying to combine, but let's just separate. 
uh, we need to have a credible prosecutor general one way or another because it's not only about one case with Privat. We have so much injustice in Ukraine that Ukraine finally deserve, you know, a prosecutor general that will do the job. Finally, irrespectively of you know one or two cases, it's just for Ukraine we need a strong prosecutor that will, if, you know, in first thing that prosecutor needs to do, obviously focus on the key cases, but also do reform of general prosecutor office because it was not a reform. We all understand that it was a fake, right? So that's first. In terms of uh, in terms of um, situation with private bank, uh, what I see, right, that you know some uh, other uh, owners of the uh, uh, shareholders of the bank that uh, banks that were recognized as insolvent, um, they use this decision by the uh, by the court and that. Uh, recognize uh, nationalization uh, illegal, right? To start their own processes. So that actually, that is uh, that that is as a precedent. It's quite um, quite dangerous one. So what Zelensky uh, should do, right? He needs to appoint a credible prosecutor general, and he needs to launch the judiciary reform, which will take time. But if you don't start from the bottom courts, but from the top courts, right, and fix the the problems that were created uh, during the reform, right, previous wave of reform, right, then you can get the Supreme Court that you can fully trust. It's quite of good quality, but there are some exceptions, right. So you need to be absolutely impeccable, you know, uh, impeccable. Uh, uh, Supreme Court, uh, and also reform the the courts which are also on the top of this pyramid, right? In this case, the cases of Privat Bank or some other cases will eventually gain uh, get the proper judgment, right? And whatever this judgment is, it needs to be respected. This is the only way, because in other case, everybody has their own view of what happened with all these banks. I have my view, right? But eventually what really matters is the decision of the court. That's what matters. At the moment, when I, we see the decisions, I even don't want to invest any of my time to understand the logic behind it because there is zero trust. To the court. So the state is a long way away from, from being strong enough, it sounds like. Are you surprised? Answer. <laughs> no. I, the question is, yeah, it's, uh, it's a long way how quickly we can cover the distance. That's where the que you know, real question is. I have got my questions regarding this issue. Uh, in the recent interview of Kolomoisky to Bihus Info, he said there were some uh, schemes of buying unvalued assets using individual deposits assurance fund. So it was a real robbery. Is it true? Some banks were deliberately made bankrupts to let some persons link to authorities to own those assets. You used to be a minister of finance. Look, unfortunately, Individual Deposits Assurance Fund is a separate organization that's not relevant to the government. We had a lot of questions and claims to this fund. Uh, how the assets were sold, we know how it uh, gets the assets. It's clear if the bank is destructed, the assets are transferred to the fund. But later, those assets had to be sold. But how it was sold, this was a question. It's not correct to see just on concrete examples. When we saw the procedure of selling, we noted it was not proper they asked uh, the assistant of USA to provide the models uh, of uh, procedure to have real competitors, but not just sell it to the owners of those assets at a lower price. Those procedures got improved, but not enough. So we could not say all was sold at market prices. Uh, this is my point of view as a financial minister. 
I clearly understand there were many hidden interests around and also the fund was under the pressure, but this is the case for the law enforcement. I have got some questions with no answers. That's why this is law enforcement who should provide the answers. Is that a case for National Anti-Corruption Bureau? As far as I know, the head of Assurance Fund had already left the post, and I suppose he's out of Ukraine now. Oh, that's interesting. This would be coincidence or not. Thanks, Alexander. Thanks, Brian, for joining our studio. Thanks to all who watched us. See you next week.